Minister um, Gerberg and the Irish Farmers Association. Uh, I'll start the consultation process off. Might as well put the best foot forward. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for your uh, for your address and uh, uh, speaking to us on on, on your um, your plans for the future. Just from an agriculture perspective, and I noticed you referred in your speech to the unique profile of our, our emissions profile, and obviously agriculture is a significant part of that. <coughs> we would feel it would be very important and we'll be putting this forward in the process that that is recognized and that on the other hand you have a government policy of the food harvest 2020 uh, 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 targets to try and get production and exports up 50 percent by 2020 and god knows we need we need all that and the economy needs it uh, that um the characteristics and problems around agriculture are taken into account in national legislation and in the discussions at eu level in terms of the step up um, I don't have to tell you, the figures are there uh, to show that agriculture, probably about 4% is what's possible in terms of reductions, but the current technologies, uh, efficiencies and all the rest that are available, we're prepared to, you know, to, to, to move in that, in, in that space. I think it has to be based on, on, on science and research, not on uh, ideology or any of those sort of things. And we have to be very conscious of the issue of carbon leakage. That is going to be a huge issue for agriculture in this country if we... Um, um, make the, uh, the wrong moves in, in, in this area. And just briefly, uh, I think in the areas of, uh, uh, of efficiency, of emissions efficient agriculture, of measuring it properly, and you mentioned the Lulu CF proce uh, process and the accounting methodology. Uh, sorry, agriculture has been responsible for about 50% of the forestry since 1990 in the, private, in the private sector, the expansion in that area. We have 90% of a permanent pasture base, which is a known carbon sink. We want that to be brought into the methodology and the accounting and recognized in the process. And I think with the right policies, there's a lot more could be done in the whole renewable area by agriculture, but I don't think the policy area is right, here, and I think we could, we could help there. But what I'm saying is that uh, uh, to, to avoid issues of carbon leakage, not to damage agriculture, because you'll damage the economy by, by, by doing that. And if there's a sensible or practical way forward, and I'd be interested in the Minister's views. And thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Chair. Take another question. No other questions? Don't believe it. Hand up at the back of the room. Time to think about agriculture. Uh, Minister, good afternoon. I'm delighted uh, to see your embracing of the climate change challenge uh, as someone who grappled in government with the issue uh, towards the end of the last government, uh, I don't underestimate the enormity of the challenge. Um, I'm delighted that you uh, are saying that the issues are so important that they can't be rushed. Uh, as long as that leads to decisive and strong action at a domestic level. So I've one question regarding the legislation. I wonder do you have any intention of setting sectoral targets within the Irish context. I believe it was Sir Nicholas Stern who suggested that early action is less costly uh, than action that is um, delayed. And it certainly would be my opinion that uh, early action and decisive targets uh, within each sector uh, would make it easier for Ireland to embrace the climate change challenge. So I wonder do you have any thoughts on this issue? Well, in relation to um, uh, Ger from the IFA, I, every sector has to play its role in order to meet our targets. Uh, and I acknowledged in my contribution that agriculture and transport have a particular problems, particularly agriculture. And you have issues where, where you have conflict in the EU and indeed around the world between the requirement to provide food at a time when we are challenged by a global food scarcity, and at the same time do so in a, in a, in a way that mitigates and reduces our greenhouse gas profile. And I never, I, I'm certainly, I, I'm very pleased in recent times to have a lot of visits from food companies who are getting a, a tremendous response to sustainable development products. And I think that that is a big breakthrough from the point of view of the agricultural and food industry because farmers will respond through their pocket towards providing and ensuring that those products that are sustainable or otherwise they lose market share. Uh, and I think there's nothing concentrates the mind as much as that when it comes to the agricultural community or indeed any other community. Uh, the Lulu CF process is key, critical to that in terms of uh, how the accounting measures are put in place in order to ensure that pasture is taken into account 
uh, and the manner in which uh, product is actually produced. Uh, and uh, that will be an interesting debate. And obviously with Ireland's profile on agriculture and food, uh, we will want uh, you know, to have certain understandings on the LULU-CF agreement uh, that will take account of our profile on agriculture and take account of the fact that we have uh, a very high dependence on our economy. But at the same time, I would say that it's in the interest of the agriculture and food industry to ensure that we have, on the basis of nutrition to animals, uh, on practical measures uh, that we can take there towards developing sustainable products, that we develop market opportunities based on the fact that Ireland is well placed with the traceability systems that we have for food, with the manner in which we actually uh, produce our product to make a big contribution towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions in this country, and that will at the same time not damage the economic prosperity for the country. Uh, in relation to Kieran, well, you were around, Kieran, when the, we had the farce in the last, uh, at the end of the last Dáil term, when we actually things broke up in this array, when people tried to put targets in law uh, for each sector. I'm not proposing to do that. Uh, but I am actually uh, looking at how we can work together in a less divisive way uh, in order to ensure that each uh, particular sector will do, uh, you know, take the necessary policy positions in conjunction with the government. As part of this consultation, I will welcome uh, you know, suggestions from all sectors and stakeholders to know how we can achieve that, particularly in agriculture and transport and in, and in energy. Uh, but I, 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 am, I'm, I think I'm, I'm contemplating success uh, in, in a different way. Fine. Thank you, Minister. More questions? Over here, please. Hello, um, Kira Gaynor from Oxfam, Ireland. Uh, firstly, um, I'd like to thank the Minister for um, his address. And um, Oxfam very much welcomes the publication of the roadmap um, on climate change policy and legislation. Um, a couple of points I would like to make. Uh, the first in relation to the comment there made around um, you know, responding to global food insecurity. Um, just, I suppose, coming from Oxfam's perspective, um, we would see um, that for um, developing countries uh, such as Malawi, where 85% of the population um, are rural, um, they're farming, they're smallholder farmers, they're relying on agriculture, um, on rain-fed agriculture, to, to basically feed themselves. Um, and I suppose the biggest threat to their food security is actually climate change. So by really uh, developed countries such as Ireland tackling the issue of climate change, reducing our emissions, that's how we can play, make the biggest contribution to securing their food security. Um, on the issue of climate finance, uh, very happy to hear um, the Minister say how he um, recognises uh, the importance of uh, providing climate finance to developing countries. Um, so I suppose my question would be, um, does Ireland intend uh, developing a roadmap on how we will scale up to meeting our climate finance commitments? Um, the, at, the international community um, at Durban stated uh, we would need to scale up collectively to providing 100 billion per annum um, to developing countries for climate finance. That's both for mitigation activities and adaptation activities. Um, and then related to, I suppose, connected to climate finance, um, is Ireland or are Ireland uh, looking at innovative, innovative mechanisms of generating climate finance? Um, as we all know, we're in difficult economic circumstances here. And uh, I suppose we really need to look to new mechanisms of raising finance. And one that Oxfam and a number of, of other organisations would, would be proposing is looking at how we might um, generate income from the shipping industry, uh, be it through a levy or in, in including the shipping sector in um, the emission trading scheme. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Very good. Might even get some revenue from auctioning of ETS permits. Anyone else? John? Uh, John Mullins, um, Chief Executive of Board Gosh. Um, Minister, uh, well done for throwing this litter into the match. Um, and we look forward to the consultation over the next number of months. Um, I, I think we should um, certainly understand that there's a lot going on, particularly in the energy sector of the last while, in terms of what John McSweeney and ESB are doing in terms of electrical vehicles, what has been done in terms of compressed natural gas, and what has been done right across the board in terms of smart metering, demand side management. But clearly, there are issues uh, that we have not addressed in the heat, in particular, the transport and agricultural sector. Now, there's a real opportunity, 
I think, two opportunities in the agricultural sector. Clearly, issues like uh, technologies like anaerobic digestion were great plans, but there's a critical issue where the planning legislation is not working in concert with uh, critical climate change uh, policies. Um, and that is happening right across the board, whether it's on the demand side or whether it's on the supply side. Uh, we've had arbitrary action by uh, a committee of a regulator over the last number of weeks on curtailment of renewables, which is at putting at risk uh, nearly, I would say, a billion euros worth of renewable investments over the next three to four years, creating jobs in the country. We should look at this as an opportunity, I think, uh, Minister, as well as clearly as a threat, because there have been quite a number of jobs created in the economy <coughs> as a result of a drive to uh, low, carbon, uh, low carbon. And we have set up fantastic research centres uh, in Ireland, supported by the IDA and by Enterprise Ireland, by other state agencies, uh, the IERC, the MERC, to name but a few. But I would like to maybe understand from you, Minister, how other elements of enabling legislation will work in concert with the outcome of this consultation period, because there are impediments, and I know you've spoken on a number of these in the past, but it is important we get holistic clarity to make sure that we meet these targets in the future. Thank you, Chairman. Minister. Well, Kira, um, I accept that very much, that the work on agriculture uh, and the policies on agriculture to deal with issues that are very important for developing countries are, are, are climate change. That's why I was one of the few people around the table on the European Union side, on the environment side, and when we were devising uh, our plans for Durban, that we signalled our, uh, our strong desire to have a work programme in agriculture as part of the outcome. And as you know, agriculture and maritime issues and aviation, for some reason, got tangled up together, bundled together for the purpose of those discussions, and we had to detangle them. And there were people sitting not too far from you who had to engage in that process uh, during the course of the Durban negotiations. And we succeeded uh, in uh, decoupling agriculture uh, from the other issues that were finding it difficult to get agreement, and getting agreement for the first time in 20 years to help the, the, the countries that you're speaking about, like Malawi, which I, whom I met, the delegation, and other countries for, to ensure that we have a roadmap, for to borrow a well-worn phrase now, uh, towards a work programme in agriculture that will be developed arising from Durban. In relation to climate finance, uh, this again uh, was talked about and uh, aspirational for a long time, but Durban agreed that 2012 was when we were going to have, the, for the first time, the operational side of the climate finance agenda being implemented. And there will be a report have to be presented at the end of this year in Doha uh, to see what progress or otherwise that we made. So the, the spotlight is on that issue. In relation to fast start, start finance, where Ireland's contribution uh, was agreed at 100 million, uh, when I uh, became minister, uh, 66 million of that had been allocated. And there wasn't too much hope around the place in order to see any, where we were going to get any more money. Uh, but I, got, I found 10 million in savings in the department, and you know you have options when you have savings where you're going to allocate it. And I allocated 10 million to the Fast Start Finance. Uh, so I hope that that will generate the, my commitment to the Fast Start Finance and to a, the the essential requirement for many of the countries that you mentioned to get projects up and running as quickly as possible. 33 million out out of that particular fund. Uh, it, it, it was allocated specifically for adaptation and mitigation proposals, but other monies are allocated towards the Overseas Development Aid Programme, which is very successful and which I got a full briefing on while I was in Durban as well. Excellent work being done there for the benefit of the people in those countries and some of the countries you mentioned. Um, a maritime sector levy is tied up in the controversies that you will have uh, about how you're going to fund anything. Uh, so I wouldn't like to prejudge what you're going to, where you get the outcome for to, for to provide other sources of, 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 of monies for the fund. But needless to say, we'd like to see more money from whatever source. Um, anaerobic digestion uh, and indigestion uh, has been a problem for a long time, uh, and refit charges and all of these issues have only recently been resolved. Uh, and in fact, I think they were only resolved last week. Uh, in relation to Minister Rabbit's proposals, and uh, they were much more attractive in Northern Ireland than, than the Republic. But we are conscious of the contribution that that can make, that particular policy. But planning policy generally, uh, I inherited a situation where 275 files in the department were for foreshore license applications, which would have made a major contribution towards renewable energy projects, I'm sure, if they were fast-tracked. Uh, but uh, it was a past the parcel going on for a long time between various departments. They ultimately ended up with my, uh, the Department of the Environment. 
uh, from, from agriculture and I think marine and I think transport got to look in on them for a while as well. So uh, these are, these are uh, the, the, some of these uh, foreshore license applications are going back for years. Uh, so what I'm intending to do as part of the planning policy review is to integrate the planning and foreshore license process. Uh, up to now you would have a planning, you get your planning application sorted out after a couple of years of trying and then you have to go apply for a foreshore license and depending on how busy a section in the department is or a priority that a minister gives to it will determine whether you're going to have a foreshore license in six months or indeed two years or whatever. So in the meantime the bank manager is hardly likely to wait around, particularly in this present climate. I'm sure that they have other sources and other demands on that particular money. So I, I expect that that's during the course of this year we will see more of an integration of the various factors that help to make up uh, the, 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 the planning process in relation to foreshore that will hopefully make a big contribution towards speeding up some of the projects that are in gestation or waiting to be, uh, wait, waiting to be uh, initiated, uh, particularly in the renewable energy sector. I might just build on your point, John, if you read what the OECD is doing what's happening in relation to the Rio 20 preparation at EU level. In most member states, they're all looking at that word opportunity in the context of the green economy. I think that's part of also what the Minister was talking about in terms of public consultation, is the opportunities that will arise from the green economy. It's very much centre part of the sustainable development negotiations within UNDEP. So, more questions. Avril? Mm -hmm. On the, EU, thank you. On the uh, EU ETS, which was raised, um, there's just there's quite a few interesting uh, aspects of that uh, sort of in the news of late. I'd like to know what the Irish government's position, read for that, Minister Phil Hogan's position on uh, the whole aviation ETS debate that's in our airways, what, what line we're taking around the Council of Ministers on that. Um, I'd also like to know what the Irish position will be on the um, mooting of setting aside allowances from auctions to tighten the cap generally in relation to the, well, the carbon price and, and the whole effectiveness of, of uh, the emissions trading system, which is predicated on, on a reasonable carbon price uh, as a main market tool there at the moment. What line Ireland is taking uh, on that? I mean, uh, what issue? Uh, on the whole issue of uh, setting aside some of the allowances from uh, auctions or from the cap generally, just to tighten up on the availability of carbon credits, if you like, and carbon well, allowances. A target. Mm. Yeah, um, it's all part of the sort of concerns about the cap trajectory to 2050 and mm. uh, uh, the way things are, are are a bit bumpy at the moment. Let's say that on the road. Um, and the third point I'd like to uh, ask specifically on where uh, the department is in relation to our national implementation, implementation measures in relation to the auctions, as auctions for phase three, uh, the option, uh, auctioning of allowances. Um, I think only seven countries had their plans in, we used to call them national allocation plans, had their plans in uh, at the end of last year when it was the deadline. Ireland is not among them. I suspect it's because you've sort of pressed the pause button there and said, let's look at this. But I mean, where are we in terms of uh, the deadline and what are our plans in relation to the national implementation measures in this area? Um, please look after the agricultural issue too. Uh, I just want to reiterate, I've been concerned for some time, even though it's uh, not an area I have been involved in in the past, unlike the ETS. Um, but to me, it seems patently obvious with the amount of permanent pasture with the Lulu CF whole issue. Even conservation tillage, please throw into the mixture, because an awful lot can be done in that area there, that we should be able to match our, our, our ruminant economy, let's put it that way, with, with, with the green Ireland in the right sense of that. And best wishes on the outcome of the referendum to all of you in government. <laughs> yeah. round if you want. I'll just ask one or two short ones then. Okay. Look, on adaptation. Uh, in Ireland, along with other European countries, adaptation measures have a very, very low priority. My immediate concern, Minister, is that for the last few years in Ireland, uh, we've been experiencing deluge rainfalls. Just to give you a, a simple example. 
Now, there's hardly a building or a road that has been designed and constructed to, to accommodate these types of rainfalls. We could have been doing very small, simple things starting four or five or six years ago to, to begin the adaptation process seriously. But the department is not treating this whole area seriously at all. Nothing is happening. On, adapta on mitigation, sorry, I have a question with regard to the reliability of our mitigation-related databases. In the absence of an independent, competent, and thorough inspection system, <clears throat> there are serious differences between calculated performance and real or actual performance. To the extent that this problem has been known about by the relevant organizations for quite some time, I'm talking about many years, our databases can actually be said to be corrupt. So could you please look into that problem? Thank you. I think you have five or six questions there, Minister. Well, Avril, uh, certainly in, in relation to uh, agriculture, you can take a part of my contribution there. Uh, we are conscious of the fact that uh, you know, there is a balance that has to be struck between the issues of global food security, notwithstanding what Oxfam said, uh, but also uh, the tighter targets that are required will be a challenge, uh, but necessary, I think, in across the sectors. Um, we have a, a very ambitious trajectory uh, to meet, uh, and the Environment Council next week uh, in Denmark will be setting out its stall in relation to how we're going to hit 2050. And it's all more ambitious all, all along the time. And I've indicated there that 2020 is probably going to be a little more ambitious from all member states. Uh, but the setting of targets and options is part of, hopefully, that we'll engage in this consultation process from a national perspective. Um, the case of the ETS is, is fundamentally tied in to a very complex lens, landscape within the roadmap to 2050. Uh, and I will be following up on those issues. I don't want to say today like what our position is will be in terms of how we're going to do those things because I have to present at the at the Council of Ministers meeting uh, next week uh, where there's a, a lot of options for, to engage proactively in some of the very complex and sensitive issues on that. Um, in relation to aviation and maritime uh, aviation matters, uh, I think I'll ask John McCarthy, my Assistant Secretary, who's across another department in transport, or Tom O'Mahony, might be there and might be able to give you an answer on that. Where we are? Yeah, just in, in broad terms, thank you. In, in broad terms, there's, uh, there's been much debate and comment in relation to the, the aviation uh, inclusion in the ETS from the start of the, uh, from the, start of the year. Um, and I think there's, a, there's a, a unified position across all 27 uh, member states, Ireland included. Um, and I suppose it's, uh, there are two, uh, two crucial pieces to it. One, it's uh, the inclusion of aviation in the, uh, e, uh, in the ETS uh, applies to European and non-European airlines. It's, it's across the board. Uh, and number two, uh, there's a clear willingness uh, and, and acknowledgement that um, uh, I suppose a, a preferable outcome in the longer term would be through uh, uh, an ICAO process and there's a clear acknowledgement uh, in, the, uh, in the EU ETS um, extension to aviation that if corresponding measures happen to be introduced in other jurisdictions, then Europe, uh, Europe will certainly be, uh, be acknowledging those. So those are, those are the positions um, uh, and as I say, they're, they're unified positions uh, um, across the 27 member states um, and uh, so they remain. I don't know whether Tom uh, wants to add anything uh, further to that? No, look, I won't waste time bringing the microphone over just to say it, it's not only unified across the 27 member states, but it's unified across the sector councils in Europe as well. Because the, Europe's position on climate change has been decided at head of state level and has been consistent at head of state level. And while you know there might be divergences of emphasis in transport or in agriculture councils or in environment councils, the hymn sheet that everybody seems to the hymn sheet set by the heads of state, and it is consistently one of, as, as John has said, of Europe taking a leadership role. Uh, it, it now becomes very difficult in aviation because of the pressures that we're going to be under, but there is no sign across the European Union of any desire to um, um, move away from the strong position we've taken. 
a certain um, uh, national airline is charging its passengers five euros per flight um, by way of compliance cost. Um, actually, if you do the math, it's probably three times the actual compliance cost, so it's a nice little profit maker for an airline. Minister, sorry. would you like to... No, Mr. Peter, yeah. sorry, just in relation to the um, one, one final point, I think that Avril raised was in relation to the NIMS. Uh, we have uh, the EPA is the, is the competent authority in relation to that, and the NIMS uh, plan, I think, has been submitted to the Commission since the... Uh, we weren't there at the end of the year, but we are, we are there since, uh, since then. Yeah. I know the other questions on adaptation and mitigation uh, are measured. I, I'd be surprised if the, the data is corrupt. Uh, and the manner in which it's calculated. So, you know, if you have evidence of that, I'd certainly want to investigate it, wouldn't I? Uh, but uh, I, 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 yeah, I'm anxious to hear from you on that because that's a very serious charge. Uh, second of all, adaptation, having a low priority. Well, it goes back, and I would agree with, uh, with, with uh, Kieran Cuff and others over the years, that we are developing a sustainable development framework in the context of Rio plus 20. And part of the, uh, of the policies that have been pursued in the past weren't appropriate <coughs> towards dealing with a lot of the issues that now require adaptation. Uh, so I think you'll see a comprehensive response at the end of April from government about how we see the development of the sectors, including policies towards not only mitigation but adaptation uh, towards the climate change agenda. And flooding, flooding is, 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 is with us, but we've had a good winter this winter. Right? Lucky enough, maybe, maybe I was lucky. Uh, but it won't always be the case and uh, in terms of Irish response. And uh, uh, we have a difficulty in dealing with a lot of adaptation measures because we haven't the money to deal with them at the moment, arising from some of the mistakes that were made in the past. But as resources apply, we will. That's all I can tell you on today. I, lo I look forward to hearing from you about the corrupt chart. Dick. Dick. Minister Dick Button from the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, you've had several questions which have touched on the issue of the agriculture sector. And I'd like you to look at that question again, but this time from the other end of the microscope. In your remarks, you said, you know, the non-ETS sector has got to achieve a 20% reduction in emissions by 2020. The special case of the agriculture sector and the difficulties in the transport sector imply that non-ETS industry is going to have to carry the burden of a reduction considerably above 20%. Can you please give any guidance for your department's quantification of that scale of the burden? For industry needs to know what it's looking at before it can consult and uh, contribute to your consultation process. Well, I think that the policy analysis that we're carrying out with the NESC Secretariat is going to inform us in relation to what policy initiatives we must take, and then we'll know that by June. Uh, and uh, there are some unpalatable ones, I'm sure, that will be looked at in context of, of that debate. Um, but I, I'm not going to prescribe today any policy options in advance of uh, NESC and the consultation process, giving us some indication of where we're going to meet our targets based on the options that are going to be presented. I think it's important that views are contributed as part of the consultation exercise, which in turn feed into the NESC analysis. So if I gave you, if I gave you the outcome, sure, you'd know by the consultant. <laughs> Duncan there at the back. Thank you, Minister. And it's great to see that legislation on climate change is now a priority and that you, you, you know that you're putting forward now structures that are going to deal with it. But it's, we all know it's going to be very difficult to achieve the targets that you're setting, you know, for us as a people. But in doing so, it's going to need mechanisms instruments that will drive the change. Otherwise, we're not going to achieve it. What sort of mechanisms do you think you will introduce? You know, environmental taxes, for example, on one side. Um, mechanisms that will, because there's very little money around today. So what are the ways that you're going to drive this change that will really make it happen? Because without those, I can't see any change really happening. Somebody beside you there at the back. Gentleman here, just in front of you. Um, thank you, James Nix from um, Corporate Leaders in Climate Change. Um, Minister, thank you for publishing the uh, consultation today and um, uh, for giving us a very good address. Um, I've read the roadmap and just one overall comment. I, one, one thing I notice is that generally publication of submissions to you take place about seven to eight weeks after receipt of them. So, for example, at the end of consultation in April, um, it's the end of June before, before they're published. And again, 
with the NESC interim report, it's about seven or eight weeks afterwards, and the same again with the final report. So there's about a two-month lag um, between receipt and publication. I'm just wondering, is there scope to enhance the policy-making process by shortening that window between receipt of, con between receipt of material and submissions and between their publication? Okay. Thanks. Ray? Just behind you. Sorry. Uh, Ray Bates, UCD. Uh, thanks very much, Minister, for your very interesting talk. <clears throat> uh, I have a question regarding uh, what your views would be on how the EU is going to respond to the different uh, attitude taken in North America by our North American friends. They're receiving the same scientific message from the IPCC, and in fact, most of the world's leading climate scientists are American. And nevertheless, the, the response to the message they're getting from the climate scientists is very different. So I would like to know what, what your views would be on how the EU is going to cope with this, pro this problem. Okay. Thanks. Pat there beside you. Sorry, Pat Finnegan. Thanks, <coughs> Pat Finnegan from Green. Um, thanks very much, Minister, for um, your reflections on the challenge of getting to grips with climate change. And Green looks forward very much to um, working towards a framework that will get us there. I'd like to ask a question perhaps a bit more normative than some of the ones we've had this morning, and uh, it's related to the item you mentioned that equity is crucial to the climate policy challenge. You mentioned it twice. It's the first principle of the Climate Convention. Um, and I, I think one, what, the way I'd like to couch it is this, is if, if things were equal at the moment, if current emissions were divided equally, across the globe, uh, we'd all have access to about six tonnes each per year, roughly where China is at the moment. And as you know very well, uh, in Ireland we're at least double that. Um, if we are to get to halving global emissions by 2050, then it has to be well below three tonnes uh, per person. Um, I. Thanks for your policy document that initiated this uh, policy initiative you've taken in November, but I can find no reference in there to the equity aspect, e.g. in the mathematical terms I've just outlined. Is that because it's just not there? Or is that because in some way a decision was taken that those sort of arguments don't help in Ireland? And I'd really like to hear your reflection on that question because I'm, I'm sort of putting it to another aspect you mentioned, this whole vital question, in my view, of who we are and what our aspirations are. I would like to think our aspirations were that we are a moral people, <coughs> that we do believe in equity, and that that should therefore trigger um, our approach to this problem. Thank you. And a final question, this lady here. Better. Hi, um, my name is Annick Barrett. I'm from World Design and Kimmich DSC. Uh, I just an add on to um, the possibility of uh, funding for um, adaptation resource. Use, uh, what is Ireland's position, and is there any hope of bringing a consensus in on the on the Tobin tax that some of the countries have agreed have, have agreed on? Minister, by way of wrap up. Well, I think. Uh, Duncan, you'll agree with me that the best form of incentive is, to, is financial. We'd love to feel that we're all moralistic about these things, and including, I'm sure you're, you, you dip in and out like I do about, mor about morals. Uh, but when it comes to money, about energy efficiency, uh, and about all of the various standards that we require in the business that you're in, would actually, once people see that they can actually save money by implementing a particular course of action, and at the same time meet a very essential <coughs> policy objective, they respond. So Sustainable Energy Ireland and, uh, and uh, all of the various the local authorities that drive this uh, effort uh, at the moment and probably should expand it more rapidly, retrofitting schemes and all of this through the energy utility companies which they're looking at at the moment with board cash and ESB. That's the way forward in order to ensure that we meet we, that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and that we meet our targets in that area. Now, that, has, that principle has to be replicated in so many different ways. Uh, and I think that that's part of what I would challenge the consultation process, is where are the initiatives that can be taken and the policy propositions that can be put forward to us that will actually 
make it a difficult situation for a lot of people more palatable, but also save the money and achieve our overall objectives of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So we all want to head for a low carbon competitive economy. And I sought, and I'm coming across to Pat's point, sought to present the environment policy as not something that people should be afraid of, that it should be part of our mainstream life, uh, mainstream economic activity, and that we take serious account of the environment implications of what we're doing. Uh, and across all of the various policy areas in each department, that's what I've been trying to extract from ministers, and I'm, with mixed success, but I'm getting there hopefully, uh, that, would, that we're able to implement policy instruments across departments that will achieve those type of uh, objectives. Uh, and so they are the mechanisms to drive change, in my view, self-interest, uh, save money, uh, uh, and schools who are, have to deal with a lot of demands on, on monies at the moment, they're fundraising with, their pa with the parents and all this for water, rainwater harvesting, water conservation, all of the issues that hopefully that I will be seeing uh, showing to you that are the centre stage in our new water policy which will be out in the next uh, six or seven weeks. Uh, the two-month consultation time, James, I, I think it's a reasonable length of time for people to respond. Oh, sorry, the, the, the window, the window between receipt of the material and its subsequent publication, there are two months between the mm. Yeah, we'll have, a look, we'll have a look at that and see as we, we, want to, we want to shorten it a bit. Yeah, have a look at that. The political will raise what's important in terms of this agenda. Uh, and Europe has demonstrated great leadership in relation to dealing with this agenda. I wish everywhere else could like the North Americans, even though they have the same science. Uh, but the political will in the United States hasn't always been the same. I know there was a lot of commitments given by the present President of the United States about these matters, which he hasn't lived up to, uh, maybe to the extent that he should. Uh, but maybe, maybe the electorate in, 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 in the forthcoming elections will be able to show that they have a bigger interest in it than that they are. But I, you know, I, you'd have to say that they haven't demonstrated that. There's too many, there's a huge amount of vested interests in that country, of course, that uh, militate against this agenda. Uh, and that's going to be it. But the European Union leaders at heads of state at the G20 meetings and all that, they regularly you know, press home the importance of dealing with this particular issue. We don't. Uh, but I, I think at the same time, it comes back to the other way of presenting it. The European Union, if it develops a low carbon competitive economy, uh, will certainly demonstrate that there's advantages to the United States in following the same lead. I think China, notwithstanding the fact that they regularly don't get engaged in all of this process on a political level, they're very much engaged in their own country. Uh, and they'll someday we'll all wake up and we'll see we'll be flooded with all sides of products that are so sustainable and so very important, compatible with what our agenda is that, we'll, uh, you know, that, that they'll, 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 they'll over, overrun a lot of the markets uh, overnight. Uh, so it's the political will to deal with that I think is the most important. And Pat, uh, uh, the, the, we have EU legally binding targets, and I don't want to get into a prescriptive and divisive debate about a, red, you know, a target based debate. I want to get into a policy debate about how we can, across the board, deal with all of these issues in a less divisive way. That's the lesson I learned from the last uh, encounter we had with trying to uh, you know, put, uh, I suppose, under the definition of equity into the system in terms of targets being prescribed in law. Um, we will have, a, obviously, a challenge for to meet our targets by 2050 if we're going to have them, but I'm determined to, to, to work with my colleagues in government and with stakeholders to ensure that that happens. Um, the adaptation measures are, adap the adaptation and the necessary funds that have been provided across uh, the sector, I, 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 I haven't considered the, the Tobin tax implications, uh, certainly massively yet, but I certainly will consider them. Okay, Minister, thank you very much.